Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Quadrice Fuels International PLC Investor Presentation Update and Bio MSAR and MSAR. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime via the QA tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply click QA, type your question, and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and you'll be notified once they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Mike Kirk, Chairman, and Jason Miles, CEO of Quadrice Fuels International PLC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone, on uh, what is a very bright and sunny day, certainly where I am, and, and perhaps over much of the UK, but definitively in England, given the result last night. Um, I can't promise you anything as um, sort of nail-biting as uh, the uh, uh, the match last night, but I hope everyone is, is looking forward to the update. Obviously, the RNS went out on uh, Monday morning. Um, we'll get through the presentation as quickly as we can, because as always, we know You've got lots of questions and that's the real value of having this sort of, uh, of meeting is the ability for you to put the questions to us. So with no further ado, I'm going to start as usual. I'm going to give a brief introduction. Then Jason will come and give the uh, sort of real nuts and bolts and details surrounding our um, work on BioMSAR and the projects that we're actively pursuing with our clients. I'll then come in and do, give a brief uh, resume, re resume of where we've got to and then we'll go straight into the uh, Q&A session. I think I'm going to go through this really quickly because I'm assuming most of you are reasonably familiar with us, but we are a unique business which is providing a solution which is reducing heavy fuel oil oversupply. It's economic because it's saving refinery distillates and it's providing cheaper energy. We'll come on and tell you a little bit more about some um, issues that are affecting us right at the moment about that. But definitively as well, it's giving less pollution. It's much cleaner to use. It burns more like a gas and significantly reduces um, particulates and NOx emissions. We're also going to come on and tell you a little bit more about BioMSAR. It doesn't seem like only around six months ago that we actually announced this to the market back in December of last year things have really progressed very rapidly on this and we're really excited to tell you about that. Uh, but it's patent pending technology where we're putting around 40 to 50% of renewable glycerin to go with water and residues to create bio MSAR. It's giving us the same sort of reductions in NOx and particulates that MSAR delivers, but it's also reducing uh, CO2 and SO2 as well. Um, we think this is a real game changer and we're really excited to be able to tell you a little bit more about it. Just a little bit more about what I said there in terms of where we are on, on MSAR itself. Um, and again, uh, I'm not going to read through the whole of this slide, but it, essentially what we got in 2020 was an overlay of the changes that the market was already expecting as a result of uh, IMO 2020 together with COVID. And as a result, it had a really significant impact on the market. And in particular, we'd already expected to see a reduction in HFO uh, demand. But what we then got was actually the overall reductions in demand during 2020 as a result of the pandemic, particularly in distillate products in the transportation and aviation sectors. And that actually ended up sort of skewing where the, uh, the market spreads were during the course of the year. That has continued. And as a result of that, a number of refineries actually reconfigured. Um, and in many cases, what they're doing is producing um, HFO in a fundamentally different way, which requires much less in the way of um, uh, distillates as cutter stock. And therefore, the ability to uh, put in add value for us is currently a little more challenging than it was. We are, do expect it to actually recover during the course of uh, this calendar year, particularly as the uh, the the global pandemic starts to recede and we see the economic recovery that I know we are very much uh, all hoping for. But to be very clear, we are targeting both the heavy sulfur fuel oil market and the very low sulfur fuel oil market with both uh, with MSAR. And we'll come on and tell you a little bit more about bio MSAR and how that might fit in with some of the opportunities that we are looking at in the um, marine market as well. 
And then just a little bit of a taster about sort of bio -MSAR. This is the area where we've also seen some changes during the course of the last two or three months, actually really significantly. And these changes have been really, really positive, but they've also had an impact on us as a business because we're having to bring forward our development and testing of, uh, of bio -MSAR. Um, we're seeing quite a few refineries who are now focusing on, on biofuels and renewables and carbon capture projects. What we're also seeing is people are really pulling this through a lot quicker than we thought even at the beginning of this year. Um, so we are having to accelerate the testing and development of bio -MSAR, And as a result of that, um, there are some changes that we expect to see. Uh, Jason is going to tell you a little bit more about this, but um, it is, we think, a really, really positive development that we've seen during the course of this year. Thank you, Mike. So in terms of the, uh, the acceleration um, of our plans, um, the testing that uh, we, we had planned with uh, the Bartseller engine uh, with VTT in Finland uh, has recently been completed. Um, and we're expecting a report uh, during uh, the, the coming month uh, from, from VTT, uh, which will then look to summarize, uh, obviously, on our website um, and you know, publish to, uh, obviously sh to shareholders and, and then Obviously, that goes on to then discussions with with, with MSC um, and with the OEMs in terms of uh, you know, accelerating the bio MSR testing on, for the LONOS. Um, we also are uh, in parallel doing some further work. Um, if you remember, if the remember, uh, originally the first testing on a diesel engine was done with with Aquafuel uh, on a high speed four stroke engine, uh, owned by us. Um, we've done some further modifications to the engine to enable some more detailed analysis of. Uh, uh, a performance uh, and NOx to look at further optimization um, on uh, on both bio MSR and potentially MSR fuel uh, when it's being used in a you know in that type of diesel engine. Um, so there's some further work that's planned with with aqua fuel um, this coming quarter, um, together with some uh, additional development work um, and testing on fuel formulations that offer. Most of the testing today has been done on a on a fuel formulation that's got about 40% glycerin. Um, which offers about a 20% reduction in CO2. Uh, there, are other, there are opportunities to increase the glycerin content um, to you know, attain further reductions in CO2 uh, between 30 and 50%. Um, so that's, there's, some, there's some testing planned for that during this year, uh, as well as obviously to commercialise the use of, uh, of bio -MSAR. What we're looking to do is uh, essentially go into the, the refining of crude glycerin. Um, that provides a, a low cost feedstock uh, of glycerin for, for fuel uh, and there's proprietary technology um, and actually off the shelf technology available uh, to do that. So we're, we're talking with some of the main suppliers of, of that technology uh, as well as, well as uh, some more de detailed market research and engagement with uh, some of the, the companies that are already in that um, business and have availability of, of, of crude glycerin for use. Um, Having said that, the, you know the the market for um, for glycerin is limited. Um, once it gets to a certain scale, there's just over four million tons available. Uh, you know, of crude glycerin that goes to glycerin uh, worldwide. Um, so, you know, the expectation is at some stage the you know the glycerin market will become limited uh, for bio MSR production in you know, far into the future. Uh, and as a result, we need to look at other production sources. So, some work has been uh, initiated already. Um, with the University of Greenwich, Professor Pat Harvey's team there, uh, who's been uh, involved in various different uh, work on the use on the um, on microalgae uh, and essentially the extraction of, of glycerin from microalgae uh, to make see glycerin and other uh, byproducts of uh, from that type of algae. Um, so there's some work that's uh, commissioned there, which will take place during the second half of the year. Uh, as well as some parallel testing on on other fuels, other renewable feedstocks such as uh, lignins and pyrolysis oils, um, we are getting samples sent to our labs during the second half of the year for for further testing of those types of materials to to look at compatibility uh, and the ability to essentially produce a net zero fuel um, you know, by 2030 uh, as a longer term initiative. <clears throat> In terms of the, the main projects, um, we have obviously the MSC uh, project that's uh, in the marine sector, um, where obviously they're a very large uh, shipping company, which we'll come on to. Uh, we have the project in Utah, which is an upstream uh, opportunity uh, with a very uh, low sulfur, sort of heavy sweet 
material that could be uh, applied to the marine and power sectors. Uh, and then we have an industri industrial consumer in Morocco. Um, so we'll go into, into detail into each of those projects now. So with MSC, um, I won't belabor the point that they're one of the biggest shipping companies, uh, container shipping companies in the world with a large uh, cruise line uh, associated with them. Uh, they're also early adopters of uh, environmental technology um, uh, and biofuels. They're large consumers of biofuels in, uh, in the previous years. Um, so the plan with them is still to, uh, to, to uh, commence the LONO trials uh, at the end of the year. Um, obviously, that's uh, you know, that, that, the, the pressure on us now to, to get things underway to make that happen. Um, there's been some slight delays in, um, in getting started uh, because there's been discussions around um, the possibility of advancing the, the use of bio uh in that testing. Um, there's obviously uh, lots of pressure on the, on the marine sector to decarbonise. Um, and because bio MSAR is one of the, the few, few biofuels that, that really applies itself very well to the marine sector and is not being uh, not really applicable for the transportation or aviation sectors, um, you know, but MSC are quite keen to advance the, the testing and use of, of bio MSAR. Uh, so that's that's obviously put uh, a change in focus in terms of you know, how we produce uh, the fuel, where we produce it from. Um, so that's that's delayed some of the, the, the commencement and the, obviously the sign off of, the, of various different agreements that need to take place uh, to advance the, the trial to the next phase. Um, so essentially, that's where we are. Um, we are looking to, uh, to sign off various agreements now in terms of production uh, to finalise which vessels uh, will be utilising uh, the fuel uh, and bunkering, uh, bunkering the, the uh, hopefully bio MSAR uh, at the end of the year. Um, and then the intention is that that project will, uh, you know, the Lono trials will commence uh, and run the 4,000 hours and sometime around the middle of next year, uh, depending on when we start, um, then the 4,000 hours will be utilised. You know, as before with, with MERSC, the MERSC trial, you know, there will be an interim inspection halfway through. Um, so sometime in Q2, you know, we should have the interim inspection to see uh, how things have progressed, um, you know, certainly with uh, BioMSAR uh, at, the, at the halfway phase. Um, and that will give a very good pointer as to, uh, you know, the commercial uh, reality of uh, bio MSR as a fuel uh, for the marine sector. So exciting times. As a quote mentions, though, obviously, you know, there's lots of uh, there's lots of pressure on the sector to, to look at lots of different options. Um, you know, and that that has to some degree uh, that does occupy people's time in the sector. So, you know, class societies that are involved in this, uh, the OEMs. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure to look at lots of different uh, fueling options. Um, so, you know, the availability of resources in, in that sector um, has to be prioritised to the de decarbonisation efforts, which is, again, the reason for advancing the bio MSAR uh, development work that we're doing now. With Utah, um, essentially what we have uh, is a client with, in, Gre uh, in Greenfield that's a joint venture um, with Valka and Tomco. Uh, they're operating uh, or running a test at the Petrotech facility um, and then with the intention that you know running that uh, particular uh, technology the Petrotech oil sands plant that they'll then deploy that at another facility um, that the Greenfield will purchase uh, and then obviously Petrotech um, still have their own facility as well um, where the, where the uh, technology is already installed uh, so we've been eagerly awaiting samples for quite a few months now uh, as I'm sure share shareholders will uh, Patiently remember, um, we've had some. We previously had some interim samples, um, which uh, were not representative. Um, but now that the technology is, is up and running and working uh, as it should do, um, we have some drums that are uh, essentially ready to uh, be ready to ship, and in the process of being shipped across to the UK uh, as we speak. Uh, the plan is to, within three weeks of receipt, actually run the uh, the MSR testing work. We're also incorporating now the possibility of um, also testing a bio MSAR because we think that that's a viable uh, opportunity in the in the US to produce a, a bio MSAR version of the Utah material as well. Uh, and that really offers in a low sulfur uh, opportunity, both for very low sulfur fuel oil, which is the original intention, but also bio MSAR as well to fit with the, you know, the zero carbon um, you know, technology that Petrotech had developed. 
With respect to Morocco, um, we have had a guy on site this week. Um, uh, Bernard visited the site this week uh, from our team to uh, to review the facility and make sure everything's ready. Um, very worthwhile visit. Um, you know, just confirmed, obviously, that you know what was uh, what was there and the, the process of getting in and out the site uh, are ready to uh, receive us. Who are ready, uh, eagerly ready to receive us, I would say. Um, so we've done all of the work um, on our side. All the equipment's been fabricated at QRF. You can see some pictures on the right-hand side of the uh, of the presentation in some terms of some of the materials that we've made uh, in terms of you know, pumping and heating units, uh, burner uh, burner lances and swirlers and burner tips. Um, so all of those things have actually been fabricated in, in QRF. Um, picture in the bottom right is is a facility that we'd be carrying out the uh, the test in the kiln on the in site B. Um, that will take place during Q3. The equipment that we're sending out there in terms of the pumping and heating unit is applicable uh, for utilisation then in site A. So that will be moved to the other, to the main site where we carried out the, the pilot trial, as you may recall, uh, at the end of uh, 2020. Uh, and then the intention is then to sign a commercial agreement, obviously subject to a refinery supply uh, of MSAR going forward for uh, supply to the client uh, as early as you know the early part of 2022. Back to you, Mike. Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Um, again, I'm just going to go very quickly because I can see questions coming in now. But um, you know, clearly, we were delighted with the successful fundraise, which was a mixture of a placing and an open offer, uh, both of which were very heavily subscribed. And again, um, just like to thank all of the shareholders. Whether you participated in that or not, a lot of you have been along with us for a long period of time, and it is much appreciated. We just outlined to you there how we're going through the process of um, addressing the major projects that we've got during the course of this year in, with MSC in Utah and in Morocco. Obviously, we've also got on top of that all the work that we're doing on bio MSR testing and development, and then the longer term work that we're doing in relation to uh, looking at how we would at large scale produce glycerin and refined glycerin for the production of commercial uh, bio MSR uh, to a number of clients. Uh, what we'll also be doing, and again, I can see a number of questions have come in on this, that we are continuing to look at other opportunities. These are not the only things that we are looking at by any means, but they are our key focus. And we do know that we want to and are very highly committed to ensuring that we meet the timelines that we've, uh, we've outlined here, both to you, our shareholders, and to our clients. But we are looking at these other opportunities and as and when things progress, we will be uh, providing you updates on those as well. Um, and again, I think just in summary, we've got in MSAR a technology which enables um, a traditional heavy fuel oil type product to actually burn much more like a gas, deliver significant benefits to the consumers and to the refiners. We'll come on and tell you a little bit more about some very short term perturbations around economics there. It significantly, though, reduces NOx, uh, black soot, and carbon emissions and particulates. And we're also starting to address now our work on bio MSAR, which is giving us a renewable solution that's also enabling some material reductions in CO2 to be delivered. We've got this broad picture of um, a pipeline and project opportunities that we've got out there. We're using some carefully selected partners globally. Um, and again, we'll come on to take, pick that up under our Q&A about how we continue to use those uh, throughout our business development activities. And we're now fully funded through to the second half of 2022. Again, we are absolutely still on that basis of we are positioned to ensure that we can deliver sustainable commercial revenues during the course of uh, 2022, and that we'll be looking at accelerated testing and development of bio -MSAR. And we're going to continue our business development activities, including those with the major national oil companies and with other marine. And uh, we'll be looking also at other ESG opportunities as well. I hope that's given you a good overview of where we are to date. Um, I've seen lots of questions coming in. So we will, uh, as we always do, get around to answering all of those. If we can't do it during the course of the um, session today, they will all be published on the Investor Meet Company website. Thank you very much.
Mike, Jason, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. Um, as Mike said, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. Just while the team take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed from your dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Mike, Jason, as you say, we've had a number of questions in um, during the meeting itself. Um, attendees did have the opportunity to pre-submit questions and you very kindly have responded to uh, these, which we'll publish again with the live questions on the platform itself. But we have um, got some here that we'll, we'll start off the session with, if we may. Um, the first one reads as follows. Given the comment relating to the headwinds impacting MSAR's attractiveness and refinery configurations, where will we source residue from for subsequent MSAR bio MSAR rollout on the completion of successful projects leading to commercial contracts? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the, the headwinds mentioned uh, in the RNS, um, they really relate to sort of quite fundamental changes in demand. Um, the first happened uh, well over. 12 months ago now with, with respect to obviously changes to the IMA regulations uh, and that determined obviously a, a large reduction in uh, high sulfur fuel oil production uh, in terms of who was producing what uh, but then there's obviously during uh, the period of uh, the, the pandemic that's also had a massive impact in terms of refinery uh, restructuring and reconfiguration um, the drop in, you know, the, the quite catastrophic drop in demand in middle distillate fuels and aviation fuel, especially, uh, has meant that many refineries have been shut down and, and may not ever return. Uh, and so there's some of the other refineries are only operating at half capacity. So the units that are operating that would operate normally under a, in a, a normal environment, essentially, when the demand is, is back to uh, where people would expect, um, those units are not running. So uh, essentially, the availability of, of, of some of the heavy residue streams. Um, it is really limited to the key suppliers who are really um, servicing the marine hubs. So, uh, you know, a lot of high sulfur fuel oil is still being um, manufactured and uh, sold in the marine hubs. Uh, well over a million barrels a day of uh, you know, high sulfur fuel oil uh, it, it stayed very flat throughout the pandemic for the marine sector. Uh, and another million barrels a day has actually gone into Saudi Arabia, as an example. Um, so, you know, essentially... That demand is 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 for high sulfur fuel oil is there, um, but it's that demand has really um, become more focused around a sort of set number of refineries. Thanks indeed, Jason. Perhaps another one actually for you, just really an extension of that question, I guess. Um, when can we expect 100% renewable bio MSAR formulation to be produced and tested? And also, what options do we have to replace glycerol and bio MSAR if supply availability does become an issue? Yeah, so uh, in terms of uh, supply availability of, of glycerin, the key thing for, for a fuel application is obviously a low cost, low cost energy source. Um, so the first thing to do is to uh, deploy uh, commercial scale technology um, to refine crude glycerin at a, at a low cost. Um, and, and that technology is available. It's off the shelf. Um, it uses sort of conventional refining type technology that we utilize in the oil space anyway. Um, so. Uh, fortunately, in that regard, um, you know, there's lots of uh, we're not taking technology leap there whatsoever. Um, and there's uh, there's also additional um, capacity that's available um, to process crude glycerin for, for that requirement um, in the short term. Uh, in the longer term, you know, as the, the glycerin market um, may become saturated, um, you know, essentially, if, you know, if, if we come along and start consuming large amounts of glycerin for bio MSAR, then we need another source, uh, and that's why we're looking at the algal production of glycerin. Um, and then in parallel, you know, looking at some of the other renewable sources that went with which uh, renewable fuels that may fit very well uh, with a water-based system that we offer with our, with our MSAR technology. Um, so, you know, we're looking at a number of avenues in parallel. Um, the first thing is to, to really commercialise bio MSAR uh, and establish commercial, commercial supply. Um, and then glycerin availability should hopefully be a nice problem to have. Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. Um, the next one we have here is, has there been any development with other global partners such as um, Bitumina, API Poly, Freeport, Merlin, etc.? Um, no, at this stage, we're continuing to talk to a number of partners, but with those particular people, they haven't been a focus and there's nothing really material for us to update on at this point. 
That's great. Thank you, Mike. Um, and, and I guess another kind of partnerish question, is there any development through the Carlisle Group synergies identified in prior updates? Um, again, it's one where we are continuing to have those discussions, but there's nothing to actually update on at this particular point in time. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, if we can just run down to perhaps the next one, which uh, I think is probably just based on some of the projects. We've got a number of questions relating to the KSA, Ecuador and uh, Mexico projects. Just a, a general update. Um, if you could give any further colour on those, that'd be really helpful. If, if I sort of take KSA, then I think I'll, I'll hand over to Jason to talk about Ecuador and Mexico. I think in terms of KSA, interestingly, I think Jason sort of outlined to you, um, when you talk um, sort of to, to the sort of relevant entities in KSA, they are looking to reduce heavy fuel oil demand in the marketplace in, in terms of its use in power production. When you actually look at what they're doing on a day-to-day basis, they are significantly increasing it. Um, that creates quite a challenge for us because privately, publicly, they don't see it as something that they want to invest in in the very longer term. Um, in actual fact, what they're actually doing is using more and more of it. So we see the benefits of, of MSAR and BioMSAR increasing there. But frankly, at this point in time, we've actually got better opportunities in terms of receptiveness that we're continuing to follow. Um, a number of those are the projects we've outlined and actually a number of those are other opportunities that, uh, that Jason can come on and tell you about now. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, Ecuador uh, and, and Mexico, um, you know, with Ecuador, we made excellent progress uh, um, in, during 2020. Uh, and then essentially um, that slowed down a little bit as there was a, a national election looming. Uh, there were rumours then um, or, or plans in place to actually privatise the, the refinery, Esmeralda's refinery, uh, which is one of the main candidates for, uh, you know, for MSAR testing and production. Um, but really with, with Ecuador, there's such a great fit um, for MSAR technology because they were having to import distillates um, to actually manufacture uh, fuel oil in that particular refinery. So. You know, the ability um, to, to switch to MSAR and, and solve a balance of trade issue um, is, is pretty compelling. Um, leading up to the national election, um, there were obviously plans in place to privatise. There was a, a very large restructuring as well of the, uh, the national oil company there, um, sort of leading to uh, sort of changes in personnel. Um, having said that now, the, the election is now um, complete uh, and there's some clarity sort of beginning to emerge uh, in, in terms of the future of the refinery. Um, but you know, until that's essentially um, made made public, then uh, we can't progress. But essentially, where we are um, is you know we we have our feet in in both camps. We are working with the national oil company there, um, but we're also uh, talking with some of the uh, uh, potential suitors uh, that could take over operation of that particular refinery and MSOF. It's in either case. Uh, in in terms of Mexico, um, you know, events have been quite slow there. Um, you know, I guess. There's some people can lay some criticism due to COVID, but it, it is one area, one part of the world where there's um, there's been there's definitely been some quite severe limitations in terms of uh, the speed of doing business in, in that particular part of the world. Um, we've been awaiting sign off of an NDA um, that's that's taken pretty much a year now, um, which is ridiculous, I guess, to a lot of people. Um, but having said that, now you know, we, we're in the, we're, we're very close to signing that NDA. Uh, and progressing in Mexico. And there's within Mexico, there's a huge amount of fuel oil that's now utilised for power generation. Um, there's a national decree essentially for um, for the local power generator there to actually utilise uh, fuel oil. There's a glut of fuel oil in Mexico, um, which is why obviously there's been this national decree. Um, and you know, essentially, you know, what they what they're looking to do is reduce the cost of fuel oil production. Uh, and reduce the, uh, the environmental impact of actually burning fuel oil as well. So there's 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 a, there's always been a good fit with with uh, with MSAR um, in Mexico, um, but now there's a national imperative as well that, that fits very strategically with uh, potentially the implementation of, of MSAR. So this that's one area of the world where um, you know we're looking to make some uh, some some much better progress in the next twelve months. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. And Mike, Jason. Um... Perhaps we obviously we've got an awful, awful number of questions come through as you usually do get. Um, we have got a few more pre-submitted questions. We have kindly responded to to some of these on the platform, which we can put back out and publish to people. May I just perhaps ask you just to click on that Q and A tab and just start at the the top and where appropriate, just read out the question and give your response to some of the live ones. That'd be great. Yeah, 
Right, thank you. And uh, it, I'll go right from the top. So, Mark N, do we still expect revenues in H2 2021? Yes, that is um, absolutely our current expectation. Um, Jason, I don't know whether you want to pick up the, the next one regarding to other shipping companies. Uh, in terms of do you expect other shipping companies, apart from MSC, to start the low-no trials? Um, yeah, I've, I don't think at the moment we our main focus is on uh, making sure that the, the MSC trials uh, progress according to plan. Um, there's quite a lot of work that actually needs to be um, done to get any low-no um, trial underway. Uh, I saw there was another question further down about what is a LONO, uh, what does it mean? Uh, a LONO is basically a letter of no objection uh, trial uh, on an engine, uh, in, well, basically on a, on a live vessel. So what that means is that uh, you know we load uh, our fuel onto uh, a vessel that's in commercial service, and that vessel is then powered by, um, by our fuel. So there's, there's a lot of work that, that's needed uh, and preparation that's needed uh, so that the vessel is ready to receive a new fuel um, that the fuel system is in place to, to actually utilize uh, bio MSR in this particular case um, and then and, it, it, and, and then essentially that that vessel will then operate uh, each letter of no objection vessel um, will operate for 4,000 hours uh, and the intention you know is to run um, or, or to pick some MSV sea vessels which are uh, representative of their fleet uh, and that means ideally you know, a vessel that's got uh, an MAN engine on um, an, an ME uh, engine um, that's, that's manufactured by MA, MAN diesel uh, and also a, a Vartzilla flex engine as well. Um, I'll pick up the next one Mark and again I, I think I addressed this but you know have there been any developments in KSA within the last six months uh, and if not why not? Um, no they haven't I think you know the rationale for that. It's really not a focus of ours. What we said, you know, I think two or three months ago, was that we think in terms of real engagement in the KSA and in Kuwait and other markets there, we think delivery of commercial success in in any of the other projects that we're talking about here, whether that's in marine, in industrial, or in the upstream market, will enable us to have a much more meaningful and relevant conversation with the. Uh, the relevant stakeholders in, in those particular markets. So it's not something that we're going to be rushing into at uh, this point. Then the next question is, you know, will there be a, an agreement between QFI and MSC in the next few weeks? <laughs> um, I don't think we can really comment on, on the timing of that, but further agreements between MSC and, and, and Quadrise would definitely need to be in place uh, and other third parties in terms of the production of you know, bio MSR for these particular trials. So uh, uh, we can't comment on timing, but further agreements uh, you know, are definitely planned. And in terms of the Utah samples, Jason? Yeah, I've, the, the plan at the moment is to get those air freighted across um, sooner rather than later, um, but I can't, I can't confirm uh, that that's been finalized as yet, but that, that's definitely the, the intention. And um, we've got a question here from Vic A, who I, and I know who Vic A is, so thank you very much for Vic. Um, if you, excuse me, I'm not gonna read the whole thing out, but in essence, uh, what Vic is saying is that um, actually the delays are much more significant than we've actually put in the RNS. And that as a result of that, um, we're actually, uh, you know, not paying due regard to our shareholders and, and that blaming COVID is a bit of a poor excuse. I hope that's got over the sentiment, which is, you know, I think, yeah, I perfectly well understand it. Vic. If I come back on a couple of things, but then let Jason give you some thoughts on this, I think, First and foremost, when, when you say what was put in that RNS back in January about the, the work that would be carried out in the first three months, my understanding is the vast majority of that work has actually been carried out. What Jason has outlined in terms of the issues that we faced in the market, it's not just directly COVID related, it's a mixture of COVID and actually the real increase that we're seeing in the interest in bio and renewables fuels. And obviously for these tests, we need support from the OEMs. And those OEMs have actually been quite stretched and they've been focused on things to do with renewable fuels rather than existing fossil fuels. Um, so we have tried to provide you Vic, with an accurate overview of what has happened. Um, we understand it's frustrating when things take a little bit longer, but you know we've tried to give you the background as to why that's been the case while still saying, and we, this is what we currently believe is that 
that is not having an overall impact on our plans. It's putting a lot of pressure on us to deliver that, but it's not having an overall impact on the timescale of those plans. Jason, I don't know whether there's anything else you wanted to sort of add to that. I don't think so, Mike. I think you covered it pretty well, actually. Right. Um, Jason, maybe the next one, just a bit more about the headwinds. And I think this is primarily what, what impact we're seeing on um, the economics of MSAR at the moment, in, in particular refineries. Yeah, and I think we covered it to some degree in the previous answer as well, Mike. Um, yeah. You know, the, the headwinds, you know, we certainly see it as sort of temporary at the moment, but, it, you know, in terms of how refineries are configured and operating at the moment, that's certainly um, you know, different to how it was sort of 18 months ago. So, you know, that, that really affects the availability of sort of, you know, the high the high viscosity, uh, low value material um, from, a, from a refinery perspective. Uh, having said that, you know, we are, that doesn't apply to projects that we're working on, for instance, in, in Utah, where we're talking about a heavy sweet oil stream anyway. Uh, and it doesn't affect some of the, you know, some of the impacts of, um, you know, the projects that we're working with at a national level uh, as well that we alluded to in, in terms of Ecuador and Mexico. So, you know, there are, it's, every refinery is different. Um, it's not the same. It's hard to be generic about this. And I guess, you know, people um, may sort of cast aspersions to us that we'd be being vague, but it, it's very difficult to be um, specific um, because every case is very different when you speak to each refinery. Uh, they have their own particular case um so you know but what what we're saying is that essentially um you know the headwinds that we're seeing uh, are really linked to demand and that has changed during covid and that's that's no denying that um but having said that we see demand recovering we see distillate spreads recovering we see the economics of msr uh, only improving is you know on a, even on a weekly basis when we look at the, the oil prices going forward so uh you know overall uh, we think it's a temporary uh, temporary measure but it's certainly been I think probably for everybody, even on this call at the other end, uh, it's been uh, taken much longer to uh, to recover um, than we when we first thought. There's a, Jason, like, I wasn't yeah. sure whether there's much you, more we can say about Utah than we've said. No, I think I, I think other than you know Utah, you know the, the that Utah deposit is is very large. Um, it's quite uh, homogenous, um, and there are you know. Greenfield are not the only operator in that particular facility. Obviously, you have Petrotech and you have others in the sector as well. So um, if there's an application um, for, through sample testing that we you know that uh, that can be progressed with other suppliers there as well, that's obviously something that we are, uh, are looking to progress. And Jason, just on, on the bulk area, is there anything you want to add there in terms of, you know, who we're continuing to talk to? Uh, I can't say who we're talking to, but we are we are in sort of general dialogue with bulk of shipping companies still. Um, again, the, the focus at the moment for us is to make sure that we get the bio M, sorry the bio MSR trials with MSC uh, underway sooner rather than later. Um, it's difficult to get much bandwidth or, you know, within the company on other on other competing trials, and you know trials take up a lot of time. Um, the key thing for us is to actually get the approvals, not, not necessarily carry out a trial. We don't really need to do a trial on another uh, with another supplier if we can get approval from the OEM on that particular type of engine. Um, so for us, it's really most important to get the MSC trials up and running by the end of this year, um, which is our target. Uh, and if I can, there was a, a, an answer further down, which was actually if yeah, if we're consistently showing that MSAR does what it says on the tin, why are we continuing to sort of offer free trials? I'd say, just to pick up that point that Jason has said now, when you start looking at sort of the sort of loaner trials, once you've got that approval on a particular type of engine, that is applicable to anyone who's using that type of engine. So we think, one, that once we've got that over the line, that gives us a, a very large addressable market. Um, and just to put it in context between them, sort of man and Bartsilla have got over 90, 80% market share in the uh, in the markets that we're operating in. So it gives us a very large addressable market. Um, I think the other thing is just to reinforce, these are not free trials. We are charging customers for it. It's not necessarily full cost recovery, but these are not free at the point of use to the customers. They've got to put in significant time and effort to do it. And they've got to actually commit significant resources um, as well as capital to it as well. So. Just to reiterate to you, these are not free, uh, but um, it does help focus their mind when there is money, resources, and you know, 
engineering commitment that they need to put into these. And that's something that gives us the confidence that these customers want to follow through on this. They're not just doing it to do a trial. They're doing it with a reason in the end, which is to give them access to what they think is going to be a superior fuel at a lower cost than the alternatives. Uh, Jason, I don't know, you know, I think it's 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 part of our longer term activities, but maybe just a little bit here from the uh, question from Steve regarding uh, algal production of glycerin. Yeah, in terms of timescales, you know, we, we have a, a research project that's that's uh, just recently been kicked off with the University of Greenwich and Professor Pat Harvey um, and her team there. Uh, that will take the most the best part of this year um you know but the early the early phase of that is to look at you know the commercial viability of, of algal production of glycerin um in, in terms of uh you know the time scales and, and when that would be up and running by um it would certainly take uh, well technology is available today um to do that and, and actually glycerin and that type of algae is being used to produce other products um at some scale um, but the scale of you know the scale of the opportunity um, for the fuel market is a you know potentially a lot larger. Um, so that will take a you know that will definitely take a couple of years to be to be up and running at the earliest. And I think there, Jason's outlined to you that in parallel with that, we're doing that work on crude glycerin production. So we're not reliant on actually producing glycerin through this route to enable us to actually produce at scale um, in the uh, commercial markets. Um, next one, uh, Jason, was regarding is SEPSA still a candidate refinery for the MSAR trial? Yeah, and I think you know we are we are still speaking with SEPSA in terms of uh, you know, as one of the options for for supplying MSC for sure for the trial. And uh, another question for me, you know, are our confidence levels still at the nine out of ten level? Well, I can uh, I'll speak for myself. Yes, they are, Ian. <laughs> Yeah, they are generally. I think the only issue is for us, as always, is, is timing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you know overall, in terms of confidence in the business, it's definitely nine out of ten. Um, and Jason, I don't know whether you want to take a comment just about the owning the data from the trials and uh, our experience with uh, with Maersk on this issue. Yeah, I, I think f from our perspective, obviously, you know, it's important that we do own the material from from the MSC trials. Um, See, that requires then a commitment in terms of uh, providing some level of funding as well, which uh, you know we need to we, we need to finalise in the, uh, the agreements for the next phase. But yeah, we certainly plan to own the material or have access to the to the um, the test data for sure, um, where that was previously potentially limited by by Maersk. And Quentin, you've asked about given the work we're doing, are we using the R and D tax credit scheme? Absolutely. Um, we're very diligent about our, our use of that scheme. It's given significant income to the business over the years and will continue to do so. And just by the by, we look at opportunities to seek other sources of funding as well as appropriate. Uh, marine and biofuels, what other options are MSC exploring? Uh, are there any serious competitors to bio -MSR? Well, you know, there, there are other biofuels available today that are being tested. Um, you know, we can see those in the in the news uh, if you scour, scour marine biofuels i think the, the difference is that there aren't that many um biofuels which are um specific specific to the marine sector a lot of the biofuel components that have been tested are also um you know being utilized in the road transportation sector and, and aviation um so uh, you know we, we think that we've got something um that's that's tailored for the marine sector uh, and very applicable uh, Jason, I don't know that you want to pick up. There's a question from Jeremy, just maybe, you know, and it's relating to uh, access to refineries and if they need to be producing glycerin for us to be producing bio -MSR. And maybe to talk a bit about the sort of work we're thinking about in terms of looking both at refineries and at, um, uh, at sort of bunker opportunities um, and terminals and what we might be able to do there as well, Jason, in terms of the the broad spread of options that we're looking at. Yeah, that's quite a um, quite a good question, Jeremy. Um, I guess in, in terms of what's required to produce bio MSR, um, you know, we require a heavy residue stream at the moment, uh, and we require um, a source of crude glycerin, which we then refine. the The scale of the the crude glycerin um, refining 
system is sort of a modular in size as well. So it's, it's quite similar um, in size, uh, or in, in terms of the, the footprint anyway, it's quite similar to an MSAR module. So the possibility to bolt on uh, an MSAR or buy MSAR production module and a crewglycerin refining column, column next door to each other uh, is there. Whether that goes into an oil refinery um, remains to be seen. It could be potentially done in the terminal. Um, and there's an example of a, a crude glycerin refining col column that, you know, that, that's, uh, that's sitting in a bunker hub that we know of at the moment um, at the scale that we need. So, um, you know, there are a number of options uh, that are on the table at the moment. I, I wouldn't say there's one size fixes all, um, suits all, um, you know, and there's a possibility also of not necessarily having to utilize uh, the, high, the high viscosity residue for, for bio MSR initially. It's to potentially blend in. Uh, high sulfur fuel or, um, or high, you know, a viscous high sulfur fuel or stream. So uh, there's a possibility, there's various possibilities of bio M cell production that we're looking at in parallel to try and um, sort of fast track the production of it and, and not necessarily mean that we're, we're tied up with specific refineries. Um, so uh, the, the, the key thing would be to suit the shipping routes, we will be focusing on the main bunker hubs. Um, so that's important to know. Um, and, you know and that's really generally sort of error. Um, in Europe, um, the Med, obviously, um, and also in Singapore. Uh, and on that basis, uh, SEPSA is, is an option for the Med. Um, you know, they are well placed for the for Gibraltar, the Jib Straits, as an example, and they have a biorefinery next door. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a possibility. Just in terms of the next one from James C. Um, Jason, I don't know whether you, we can just say give our response to to that and that james is asking is there a possibility that bio msr will be produced in utah for our marine trial uh, it's a it's a possibility we haven't ruled we certainly haven't ruled that out um james so uh that's that is an area that we, we could we, we are looking at in parallel um i would say that you know there may be opportunities nearer nearer home that that may take priority um but that i, I wouldn't rule that out at all and one here from Mark S, which is what project do we believe will come to commercial fruition first and why and when do we expect this to place uh, take place and what might the value be? And if I take a sort of a give you an overview on this, I think based on where we are at the minute and again, please take it as what we've already said about timescales here. But the one that's got the opportunity to actually deliver first, um, we believe is Utah because once we've got those samples, we can actually carry out the testing. That will give us a really high degree of confidence about whether MSAR is uh, suitable for use there. Then subject to getting access to that site uh, to carry out the testing uh, that was going to be uh, carried out, well, it was going to be carried out last year, actually, when we were looking at getting samples uh, sent over to us last year. Uh, that's actually something that can be done very, very quickly. And then we could go into a license agreement with the client. And you know, our expectation is we could move very quickly to that. Um, where would that be in terms of value? That's sort of you know, very high five figures um, to us. Um, and that could be during H2 2021. And that's certainly what we're driving towards. Um, at this stage, um, you know, I don't want to start going into those other projects because as we've as we started talking about them, um, they are at their early stages now, but certainly the next one that could be on the cards there is, is Morocco, subject to the two further tests progressing as we expect them to do, and then being able to get a suitable candidate refinery to produce the fuel for them. But again, those are things that we would expect by that point in time, that the economics about commercial supply into the North African market from the sort of med will actually be uh, providing us with more opportunities there to look at candidate refineries. Um, what we'll do is though, we've, we've already, in terms of how we've outlined things in the past, tried to give you a good outline as to what our other projects are capable of delivering. And we'll just make sure that when we answer the questions on the um, platform, that we make reference to the relevant slides that we've uh, delivered I think earlier this year on that. Uh, question about uh, Norway. How did that come about from Morocco? Um, in terms of Norway, that came about because we were looking at um, 
essentially toll manufacture uh, of fuel uh, at a bitumen terminal that, that might be up, operate, up and running and operational. Um, it just so happens that our, our um, equipment supplier for MSI production uh, is based in Denmark. Um, so, uh, there, and there was a possibility of doing some, uh, of them doing some work there anyway, that, that fitted very well with that particular bitumen terminal. So uh, that's how Norway came about. Um, we need about 60 tonnes of fuel for the first uh, trial in Morocco on site B. Uh, so there was a there was a pretty good fit there. Um, we, we had to wait a little bit longer for them to be um, up and running and operational uh, for the bitumen uh, market, but that's, uh, that's progressing well now. Um, so the intention is certainly uh, fuel will be available for the for the Q3 trial um, from that particular location. Um, going forward, um, what does that mean? You know, will we be supplying um, Morocco from Norway um, for the commercial volumes? Uh, and that, that won't be the case. Um, you know, and even for the next trial, what we're looking to do at the moment um, at QRF is we've we purchased a, uh, a smaller scale uh, MSI manufacturing unit, which is bigger than our lab mills, but smaller than our conventional plant and we can utilize that for sort of trial trial manufacture um, of that sort of scale of volumes now certainly sort of you know around the 20 tons so that, that will fit very nicely with the um, the site B trial so we site a trial rather <clears throat> um, if I just pick up Adam C you've said um, recent RNS MSR outlook section um, found it worrying particularly given what, what you've put as vague language used, please clarify what we mean by certain markets and what do we mean by headwinds? Um, and, you know, uh, be specific, it matters, right? I think we've already covered this off, Adam, but actually to be clear, what we mean by headwinds is these confluence of issues relating to both IMO 2020 and COVID-19, a significant uh, reduction in demand for distillates, meaning that that spread that's historically been there is not there in certain markets at the minute, though that is recovering. And what that specifically meant was that certain refineries fundamentally may change the way that we're producing heavy fuel oil. So instead of actually running these units to sort of basically do hard work on the uh, residue to actually create more higher value distillate products, well, why the hell do you bother doing that when those distillate products aren't higher value anymore? You don't do it. So what we found is that despite what the nameplate might say on that refinery, the way they're operating it at the minute means that you can't add much value through the use of MSR. So I hope we've been very clear on that. It is though only specific markets. It is impacting some of those refineries in the Mediterranean. Um, you, you sp said specifically, have SEPSA said no. SEPSA have not said no. We're continuing to look at a number of candidate refineries. Um, Jason, if I just very briefly um, pick up this one from Mark S about uh, the GADA with MSC, uh, but then ask you to give a, a little bit more of the detail that um, I, I think, again, what we said is we expect those initial um, activities to take around three months. We're now six months on. So how can we say we're still on track? And I think what we're saying is that some of the work that we expected to be done during this period of time has been done. Some of those activities which were, are going to take us into the next stage of the formal agreements for the trial um, and the agreement between ourselves, MSC and Refiner have taken a little bit longer, but that does not mean that we cannot still meet the overall timetable for getting fuel on board ships and those ships to be sailing using, in this instance now, BioMSAR by uh, the end of this year, very early next year. I think you're right, Mike, and, you know, and I think to to dismiss COVID, um, the impact of COVID, you know, sounds an easy excuse for us, but the reality is that's definitely been you know, that's definitely been has impacted the availability of resources in the sector. Um, you know, shipping companies have had many different issues to deal with during the period, um, as of the OEMs, in terms of you know. This pace of decarbonisation has really taken up a lot of uh, you know, a brain power in terms of uh, you know how how various fuels can be deployed in, the, in that particular sector. So um, you know the, yeah, that has been quite challenging to get things on track. That certainly you know that wasn't part of our original planning process, which we put together together with MSC. Um, so you know it's, I think it surprised people on both sides. Um, 
And there's a question here from James saying, given it takes a minimum of six to nine months to install and commission an MNU, how can we still be targeting um, the mid-2022 loaner completion when we're behind schedule? Again, I think we've answered this, but I guess there are a couple of things just to clarify. Obviously, we've actually got the MMU that we can actually use, so you can actually take quite a bit of lead time out of that. And I think as Jason has outlined, we're talking to uh, a num we're looking at a number of options. It, it's not just refinery, it's potentially uh, terminal production. That significantly reduces the sort of time taken to install and commission, et cetera. So we wouldn't be saying this if we didn't think it was true. Is it challenging? Absolutely it is, but do we think we can deliver it? Yes, we can. Um, James, uh, I think we've already question, you know, confirmed we haven't got a specific refiner. and We're still actually looking at a number of these. Um, and as soon as we've got them in a position to enable that part of the work to carry ahead, to go out, we will be updating the market through an RNS to demonstrate that we've reached that agreement between a refinery and ourselves and um, MSC or a terminal operator ourselves and MSC. There's a question further down from William. Um, a lot of talk about bio MSAR, but almost nothing about MSAR, especially with regarding MSC. Uh, will MSC be going ahead with the MSAR trial? Uh, that's certainly uh, still the case, William. Um, it, it's just that MS, uh, bio MSAR uh, has taken a, a priority. Um, because there's lots of, you know, obviously, the sector is uh, is uh, prioritising, you know, the use of sort of lower carbon fuels, um, you know, in terms of bringing those to market sooner rather than later. So that's really brought forward the uh, the bio MSAR testing, um, but there's definitely still a requirement for for MSAR to reduce the cost of their sort of high sulphur uh, fuel opportunity and, and also potentially low sulphur as well, um, you know, where the, there's potential to supply low sulphur material from from Utah which sort of um, but doesn't quite answer Helen's um, question about uh, the MMU. Once the MMU is on site in Utah, what's the likelihood of continued operation? Uh, you know, some of that is then contingent on finding an end consumer uh, of the sort of the low sulfur material um, from Utah. Uh, and obviously the marine sector um, is, is one such opportunity. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be taking a very, very good look at the samples that we get uh, that we receive um, during the coming months from uh, or month from uh, uh, from Utah to see look view its applicability for the marine sector and also for obviously for MSR and bio MSR production. I think uh, there's a question from Imtiaz. I think we've already answered this Imtiaz in terms of we are engaged with other shipping companies. We are very focused though, on ensuring that we can deliver the MSC trial. And we will be looking to provide updates as regularly as we can across the piece. And we realized that we didn't do that during the course of the last three months or so. Um, so we are acutely aware that the more that we can do that, the better position we're in. Um, and that's going to be through both the use of social media, but obviously for anything material, that will always be coming out through RNS so that all shareholders are made aware of that at the same time. Um, uh, again, Mark S, I think we've we've probably answered this question that we're continuing to look at um, refiners for the production of uh, fuel for Morocco. And again, we will provide updates as we go through the course of this year. Um, Jeremy, you've made a comment regarding sustainable revenues now from the end of 2022. Um, I think what we actually said was during a sort of H2 2022, um, we do expect that uh, revenue to be coming through across the projects that we've outlined here. I think at this stage, uh, we don't want to disclose what the particular revenues will be from the supply of MSAR and bio MSAR to MSC for those trials, partly for commercial reasons, but partly uh, because we're in the middle of having those discussions with um, um, MSC at the moment. And I'd rather those discussions uh, take place behind closed doors rather than through an open environment like this. Um, Jason, I don't know whether you want to maybe very briefly pick up on this one from Mark S about, about Maersk, and I'll pick up the, the second part of the question. 
Uh, yeah, I, I can't really comment on, on on Maersk other than to say that you know we are still in discussions with Maersk on a on a regular basis, uh, uh, despite publicly what they may say uh, with regards to transitional fuels. Uh, that's still part of their uh, of their their decarbonisation platform uh, in the near term for sure. Um, and they you know, are utilising biofuel today um, in certain cases. So uh, you know we know that's the case. Um, and you know, is bio MSAR beyond the scope of any commercial agreements? Um, no, not potentially. No, if, if bio MSAR is, uh, you know, if bio MSAR works as, as build um, for MSC, then uh, there's a there's scope and possibility um, for supply to some of the other um, players in the sector, including Maersk. And, and to come back directly on your question, what, what do we think in terms of our existing agreements with Maersk? Our view is that there is nothing to um, that would be relevant for us to be paying to them because we regard those um, those agreements as, as not in place anymore. Um, uh, I'm not sure there's much we can say, Helen, in terms of the two marine engineers on the MSC project, other than these are experienced people from industry who've worked alongside us in the past and they're going to help to uh, smooth the path to uh, delivery of that MSC project on those you know, tight timetables that we've outlined to you. Yeah, definitely a future benefit for you know, some of the four stroke engine applications as well. Well, one's an expert in two strokes, one's an expert, I guess, in, in, in four stroke applications. Um, so very, very useful for, for the company. Uh, and Mark, I think we've answered a lot of your question here against in terms of, of MERS, but I, I think probably the only thing to add here that because you've had specifically will will they be conducted largely within the eco zones or outside, uh, which might hasten the trial duration as these are going to be taking place on board vessels with scrubbers. It doesn't really matter where they're going to be operating. And that's one of the things that we've got the confidence about that uh, they're using scrubbers so they can operate on the fuel that they are using throughout the course of their uh, steaming. So that's why we've got that confidence that we can actually get that those trials delivered in that relatively short timetable. Um, Christian, you said, have we gone from having all our eggs in one basket to spreading ourselves too thinly? Um, I think to give you a very clear answer, we don't believe that's the case. We've now got a number of projects that we're looking at. Um, there's no doubt um, they are challenging to manage for us, but actually they're well within our capabilities. And um, once we start getting back to being able to operate more normally and also undertake our business development activities more normally, um, we will be looking as appropriate to backfill some particular roles to free up, particularly Jason, and Mark to undertake more business development activities as well. But to be very clear, we, we do not believe at all that we are spread too thin at the moment. It's the, the question by Philip about the uh, commerciality of bio MSR versus, versus yeah. MSR. Um, I mean, the, the two products are not really uh, in competition with each other. Um, you know, MSR is in competition with, with conventional uh, fuel oils, high sulfur and low sulfur. Uh, and bio MSR is in competition with biofuels. So the way that we, we view uh, and present the competitiveness of, of both products compared to uh, conventional products is we look at the, the you know, the, the cost per unit energy to the client uh, on a delivered basis. Uh, and that's demonstrably, um, demonstrably uh, cheaper for both fuels compared with the, uh, the, with the alternatives. Um, you know, we've done some recent economics uh, on, on bio MSR as well um, to compare that uh, bio MSR versus biofuels from different sources, uh, both from uh, from HVO, um, sort of hydro uh, hydrogenated or hydrotreated vegetable oil, uh, but also from uh, from FAME as well. Um, and you know, by per unit energy is much cheaper, uh, and those savings become even higher as as you look for further CO two reductions. Um, I think we've already picked up Mark S's question about the other opportunities in Utah. I think, as Jason said, there are a number, it's a very large basin, there are a number of operators, and we see the potential for us to be working with a number of operators there. Um, and again, I think um, uh, this question from Alistair W, Jason, I don't know whether it's just worthwhile just 
picking up one particular point, but um, on that one. But before I do that, it, while you're thinking about that, if I can pick up one from Mark S in regard to KSA and Kuwait, um, you know, have they dropped off the radar completely? Uh, no, they haven't. Are they things that we are really actively engaged in? No, and I think what I've tried to outline at the beginning of the presentation and just as we got into Q&A is that we really think fundamentally, despite what they say in those markets, um, they are large consumers, particularly the KSA, and they're now even larger consumers of heavy fuel oil for power generation and actually water uh, purification purposes. Um, that really hasn't fundamentally changed. So we will still be looking at those marketplaces but we think it's a much easier discussion for us to have when we've actually demonstrated commercial success of MSAR in either the marine, the industrial or the upstream market. And we will be very, very clearly readdressing those uh, significant stakeholders in those marketplaces. We have kept uh, sort of informal contact going, but in terms of really active engagement, that will follow on from commercial success on the existing trials. Uh, Helen, I think we've, um, at what point will we be updated on the MSC trial and how likely are we to get a refiner on board? In, it, in essence, those two things go hand in hand. We know we've got to get a refiner or a terminal on board. We're working really hard to do that. As soon as we've got any material updates, Helen, we will provide those to you. We're very clear about the timetable that we've outlined. So we realize that there isn't necessarily a huge amount of time for us here. But we also know that we can actually concertina a lot of this work down a lot more aggressively than we've done in the past, um, if everyone plays ball along that. So we will update you as soon as possible, um, and that will include all the relevant details regarding where we're going to be producing fuel, who it's going to be with, and then what the final timelines are for the, uh, the trials. Um, uh, the one from Adam C, Jason, I don't know whether you just want to pick up about, you know, why sort of about Bitumina and Utah. Uh, yes, well, certainly Utah um, and potentially Bitumina do offer a, a non-refinery based source of MSAR. Uh, I would say Bitumina are more focused on the, um, on the, on the bitumen market, um, but Utah certainly offers uh, an opportunity, um, you know, essentially a natural bitumen uh, or asphalt material that could be utilised for MSR production. Um, so that 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 does take away the uh, uh, you know the requirement or the limitations that there may be in certain parts of the of the world in terms of refineries at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, there, there's a question further down in terms of is bitumen a commercially viable feedstock um, for conventional MSR? Uh, I'd say yes and no. Um, bitumen. Uh, there's lots of different grades of bitumen. Uh, I would say that there's certain natural bitumen uh, applications like in Utah and other parts of the world where it does make sense because uh, of the cost of extraction uh, and shipping um, and the requirement for dilution. Um, but in, in terms of bitumen as it may be purchased from a refinery, that material has been further processed and oxidized and that that is not necessarily um, a material that we would consider. Normally to make bitumen, uh, you take a refinery residue and, and then you further treat it um, to, to make the bitumen grade. So we, we are taking that intermediate material in the refinery. That's the whole purpose of the MSAR uh, process in the refinery is to take that material um, before it's further up, uh, you know, further upgraded. Uh, just in terms of, you know, Adam, you've asked um, the fuel that pre being produced in Norway, why haven't we used Bitumina, well, again, in this instance, we were looking for specifically a relatively small volume of uh, fuel to be produced for the trial. We've been doing this through not just directly, but through our partners at, um, at one of the suppliers of our uh, MMUs. Um, and it was then a, it, that was already a fallback position from hopefully being able to produce it in the UK. And that wasn't possible because of COVID. So, you know, we're seeing this as a short term solution not something we'll be looking to do in the longer term. Um, and just Alistair, you've asked, uh, Alistair W, you've asked about 
we've we've added uh, some engineering personnel. What about uh, bringing in some sort of technical business development personnel to explore and develop sales opportunities? I'd say in terms of our sales and business development capabilities, um, Jason is is probably is is our most important asset there, as is is Mark as well, our chief operating officer. And actually, we see the key thing is not actually bringing in new people to try and do those roles, but actually freeing up Jason and Mark to do more of that. Partly that will come about because of the natural opening up of COVID restrictions, but partly it will be through backfilling some of the roles so that um, they can offload some of the work to colleagues within, within the department, particularly once we've got a number of these operational and moving towards operations, they can then start freeing up their work to actually start looking at business development again. Uh, on a, a very active basis. Uh, there was a question further down with David from David G. Um, with regards to Morocco, are we, um, you know, uh, which one? I've got? Sorry, I've got two from David, or three from David G. Pardon me. Um, one further down is basically asking whether. Um, whether the factory owners would, would decide they only want to work with BioMSR as opposed to MSR. Uh, that's not the case. Um, you know, the intention certainly is for that to be an MSR project going forward. Um, you know, in the future, obviously BioMSR is, is in scope as well, but at the, mo at the moment, the focus is, is certainly on uh, the use of, uh, of MSR for that particular project. Uh, David G, you've just asked, you know, regarding the Morocco trials, given the fact that you've been able to visit the site recently, why does the trial require further easing of COVID restrictions and why are UK restrictions relevant? I guess there are, there are a couple of things there. Um, it is relevant because we're UK based and our people have got to go out. So it's not just a matter of them going out there when Bernard comes back from site, he's got to self-isolate for six days, which means he's not available to us in the normal way. So We've got to be taking those sorts of things into account. And also we're producing the, uh, the fuel over in Norway, and that has, has got significant sort of issues in relation to us or actually our partners um, from Denmark being able to go out and undertake that work because of COVID restrictions. But having said that, the fact that Bern has been out there is clearly a key moment for us, and we're, great. we're really delighted that he's being able to undertake the the work that he did there, and we will be in a position to actually get the equipment out there and undertake that trial as soon as those that fuel is produced for us in Norway. The question at the bottom from Miles M. Actually, um, do we see the marine industry as the largest market for bio MSO? Uh, are there many marine companies now actively approaching on the back of uh, the MSC JDA? Um, that's yeah, you know, we certainly have had. Uh, dialogue with a number of different um, marine companies on the back of the uh, the MSC uh, JDA. I, I think as we certainly as we progress, um, you know, the bio MSR, let's have no objection um, trials with, with MSC as well, um, you know, announced developments in that regard, then that, that will certainly you know, continue that interest, especially in, in bio MSR. Um, and, and we do see the marine market to answer the question um, properly that you asked first of all, you know, we certainly do see the marine uh, market as the, you know, the largest market potentially in the future for bio MSR. Um, primarily at the moment, that's driven though by, um, I guess, some of the in the cont container sector, some of the clients that are you know, putting pressure on the, the container companies to uh, to decarbonise. Um, ideally, uh, to to stimulate the, the use of biofuels in the marine sector, you know, if you look at how that's been done in other sectors, that's been done through regulation. Uh, and or incentives uh, and that hasn't happened as yet in the marine sector um, you know that, that's an area where we you know we expect that further changes will be uh, will be imminent that will then hopefully stimulate and, and drive um, you know the demand for biofuels which are you know which are more expensive than conventional fuels for sure. Um, Ian you've just asked a question regarding Utah QRF testing MMU shipment installation commissioning timeline and I think you know all we can say is because all we've ever said to shareholders is details of timelines that have been provided to us by Greenfield or the relevant joint, the, the relevant parties that make up that uh, joint venture between Tomco and uh, Valcor. Um, what we are doing is we're expecting those samples. We know they've been taken. 
Uh, and to answer a question from Nicholas, we've got three drums of uh, three drums of samples, three barrels of samples. Um, timeline as to when those come into the UK, that depends whether it's air freighted or not. We're still waiting for confirmation of that. What we have, uh, I think, consistently said is once we get those in, we expect to be able to do the testing activities on both MSAR and BioMSAR within around three weeks. As to what the timetable then is for us getting the equipment out onto site, that is absolutely up to, uh, at this stage, uh, Greenfield, because as we've outlined to you, that equipment was ready to go from very early calendar 2020, um, uh, and in fact, uh, sort of 2021. And you know, a lot of the work was actually carried out during the very final um, end of, of Q4 2020. So we've had that equipment available to go out there. We've been waiting for the counterparty to actually ask us to get it out there. So I don't think it's relevant for us to give you any more updates on the timelines there until we've got some clarity out of what is going to be happening there. And again, I think just to reiterate what those companies have said publicly is they the uh, license on that site i think officially ends today they're looking to get a extension for a further six months but again that is going to be up to that particular client as to what happens then and when they will call for those that equipment to be uh, sent out to undertake those tests there's a question further down from e and b um can uh, utah 10 api synthesize bitumen produced from the the core process be emulsified into power MSR, marine MSR, um, and obviously I think probably bio MSR for transportation of bitumen and waxy crude to refinery. Uh, certainly, the intention, um, the, the intention for the uh, testing that we're planning um, to do in, in the coming month on that material is to demonstrate that the MSR uh, and bio MSR processes and, and, and formulations are applicable to that type of material. Um, in terms of making it uh, that a material that, that, that would go to a refinery, um, I think we believe that there are higher value outlets uh, that may be available um, than just sending it to a refinery and getting a, a WTA, WTI related price or a discount. Um, we think that we can get a higher value for that material, um, which is the intention behind the, uh, the deploying the MSR technology. Uh, Ian, you've, you, Ian B, you've asked a question about the uh, Voltzilla VTT test. I think we said in the uh, the RNS we expect those results uh, sort of during the course of, of July. Uh, we haven't received an exec summary, but we did receive sort of anecdotal feedback, and that feedback was positive. But I don't think it's appropriate for us to say anything more until we actually get that um, report back, and then we will provide an update to shareholders on the back of that report. Uh, uh, Paul, you've asked, you know, have MSC indicated if the interim learner inspections are positive, they'd start a rollout sooner. We're at the stage of having those sorts of discussions with uh, MSC at the moment. So it's actually too early to, to sort of talk specifically about that. But I would want you to be, you know, confident that that's certainly something that we are, you know, hoping to progress with the client that you don't wait until the end of it when you actually get the vast majority of the information comes out at that interim inspection stage. That's certainly our anticipated approach, but we have to work with the client to uh, ensure that they're aligned to that as well. And uh, the, the question near the bottom, Jason from James C, uh, just about MSAR production at the current POSP site. Um, I don't know whether there's anything we can say usefully on that or not. Uh, not at the moment. I, I think it depends a little bit on what the specification of that material uh, is in, in a lot of detail. So, we, you know, we need to properly analyse and assay that material. Um, we've not got that level of detail yet to see the applicability for the marine and power sector. We certainly believe it will be applicable to the marine sector, but until we do the, the work, um, you know, we need to identify the suitability of that material, um, both for our our internal purposes and then also for you know in terms of end users as well. Um, but we certainly believe there is an opportunity um, in the marine sector uh, and the potential link up with MSC. Uh, 
got a few. Let's go. We lost Mike. <laughs> I was going to say, Jason, just, just come back <laughs> in now. I know uh, we are no just going. I know, I know that we have put this meeting for an hour and a half. We're just coming up to that point. So, and you have been um, answering a lot of questions. We'll just wait for Mike to come back in. Uh, ladies sure. and gentlemen, would you take a couple of seconds? I can answer a few more in the meantime. Um, Great. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from Gareth C. Um, I calculate in order to achieve a loan over 4,000 hours in a six month trial, um, that require an average of 22 hours steaming per day. Um, this is practical. It, it depends a, a bit on the vessel, Gareth. Um, you know, some of the vessels are operating um, a lot more continuously than others. Uh, the vessels that that we are targeting, to, or certainly have targeted to use, uh, from some of the locations, uh, they're on transatlantic routes, so they are actually operating quite um, sort of nearly continuously. Um, you know, the, yes, there is some downtime during steaming. Is it exactly six months? No, it might be seven. Um, you know, when do we get started? You know, do we get started at the end of the year uh, sooner or sooner or later? You know, all of these things we're looking to uh, to finalise now. So the exact timing, um, you know, it's hard to get it down to the nearest week or week or month at this moment in time. Um, but that's the typical time for decisions to be made. I think, as we indicated with Maersk, uh, with the Maersk trial as well, um, at the midway phase, that's that gives you a good indication of, you know, of how the fuel's performing. Um, such that you may not need to have a full Lono in place before you start looking at the commercial rollout um, of the fleet. So that's 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 an area where you know um, it's hard to define at this stage uh, until we have you know we have those uh, those commercial discussions with, with MSC in the you know the coming months. Um, I there was there are a couple of questions. One from. Um, Jason T and an associated one from Paul G and really it's around expectation management I think um, and also communication with shareholders so I guess a couple of things look if um, you know I think we've got to take it on the chin if we've not delivered against your expectations in terms of where we are on these things and you know absolutely did we provide the updates that we'd hoped to during the last couple of months no we didn't um, we are looking at how we can go about providing more regular updates. Ideally, that would be uh, if we can manage it through non-RNS means. We're in the unusual position, though, that a lot of things that um, for a company that had got significant revenues would be just ordinary course of business. There's actually, for us, some seemingly quite small things are potentially price sensitive so we're always uh, up against this issue of do we have to put something out via RNS or can we use sort of um, social media, et cetera? We will get better at this. Uh, apologies from myself because primarily uh, I'm leading on, on this area. So I do absolutely hear what you've got to say. We will ensure that we put a lot more effort into providing more regular updates as we go through. Um, that is going to be a mixture of RNS. It's going to be a mixture of social media. And where we can, it might well be appropriate to just say, we'll have an investor meet presentation um, and use that just as Q&A rather than to give anything uh, sort of um, by way of a formal update, but just so that we can talk to you anecdotally about what's going on into the marketplace. And perhaps that would be quite a nice uh, thing to hear feedback from you on at the end of this uh, meeting today, whether that that type of event might well be helpful from your point of view. Uh, and if so, we'll see what we can do about delivering something like that. Right, Jason, I am just conscious of time as, as we are coming through. Um, obviously, you've got an awful lot, a lot of questions you've answered already, but just if there were any further questions that you'd like to address before we perhaps get uh, some feedback for you. I think um, if we look at the, the very last one, Jason, from James C, and again, this is this you know, ultimate thing. If And it's James C asked, if MSK commit to using MSAR, does that help refiners decide whether to get on board as a supplier? Absolutely. You know, we, we've always got this issue of uh, for uh, MSAR or bio MSAR, it is about having a long-term supply agreement. 
refiners get interested when they know they've got a client that can actually supply them in the uh, that wants to be supplied in the longer term and vice versa you can have a really good discussion with a commercial client about supply to them when they know there's a refiner willing to produce it so those two do go hand in hand for both MSAR and bio MSAR. that's great thank you very much indeed um I would of course like to remind everyone that so the team will review all the questions that are submitted today and we'll publish those back out on the platform um, once uh, they've had a chance to run through them. And Mike Press, if I could just ask you just for a few final words to wrap up and then we'll redirect the attendees to give you some feedback, please. Yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for asking so many questions. We try our best to get them out. You're the only audience that I know that actually answers more questions, asks more questions than my two-year-old boy does every day. So thank you very much. We do try and respond to each and every one of them. Um, you're always asking, I think, really good questions. Some of those are directed at and challenging of us, and that's absolutely right. You're our shareholders. You own the company. We're always doing our best to actually uh, address them during the course of this. We think these are, are great routes for us to have uh, regular dialogue and communication with you, but we are looking forward to being able to meet you face to face at our AGM later this year as well. So thank you very much for taking the time, everyone. Have a lovely afternoon and the rest of the evening. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, Mike, Jason, thanks indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team could better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the team. On behalf of the management team of Quadrice Fuels International PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's session.